Jim Backus I had in mind because I had worked with him on I Married Joan, I had worked with him in radio, and nobody does that character like he does. You know, he has that, that, that uh, I don't even know what you call it, but that super high tone voice of his when he, anyway, I had him in mind. But the other characters, I knew I wanted a skinny guy, small guy. I knew I wanted a big skipper. I knew I wanted a gorgeous, tall, redhead. Why red, I don't know, but that's what I wanted. And, uh, and a virginal looking girl and a, and a clean cut, nice professor who looked very, very intelligent. Those are the characters. But the only one I had in mind was Jim Backus. In fact, uh, Bob uh, Denver wasn't even my first choice. Jerry Van Dyke was my first choice. In fact, I brought him out here from Texas for that part. He, now they, they don't look alike at all, but they're both sweatshirt-looking guys. They're, they don't look like they should be dressed up. Uh, Jerry Van Dyke looks nothing like his, or he has not the same feeling as Dick Van Dyke, who's his brother, who has an elegance about him. Jerry had none of that. He looks like he was born in a sweatshirt. Must ask his mother about that. Anyway, uh, that's who I thought would be perfect. And he turned it down because he had an offer to do my mother the car the same year. He said, okay, Jerry, your choice. I always knew that the most difficult person to cast would be the skipper. I always knew that. And it proved to be the case. Because I wanted a big guy, physically big guy, bellowing at, at Gilligan, who's going to be a smaller, thinner person. And you need a teddy bear. Not a bear, a teddy bear. So he has such warmth that you know, no matter how much he yells at Gilligan, that he really likes him, loves him. That's a hard thing to find. I tested everybody I could think of out here, and guys from New York sent tapes, and some of them came out here for, uh, some of them became well-known actors. For instance, uh, one of the actors who couldn't, well, uh, what I did, I wrote a particularly difficult two pages where he was just screaming at him and bellowing and yelling that he did this wrong and he did that wrong and did this wrong. And I knew if you could survive that scene, you were the right guy for Gilligan's Island. And Bob was wonderful, Bob Denver. By that time, I had cast him because he was clearly terrific. He was only the second person I looked at. The first one was uh, Jay Van Dyke, who didn't want to do it. The very next one I looked at was, he was just perfect. He's a very bright guy, by the way. He was an English teacher to begin with. A lot of people are surprised at that. And he's not stupid by any means. He's very bright. Uh, anyway, the other, and Jim was a money problem, but that was CBS's problem, not mine. They asked me to test different people, and I did. I interviewed a lot of people, but I said, it's Jim Backus. And they said, he's a star, he's expensive. I said, he's worth it. And because they wouldn't let me sign Jim, uh, I wrote the script minimizing that part because I couldn't find anybody else to play it. I, you know, you have to listen to a network, they're putting up the money and they deserve to be listened to. Uh, but I shrank the part, feeling I had to go with a, a second banana who was not a top banana. And uh, he was impossible, not only, not impossible because of money, they were willing to give more money, but he was signed to another pilot. And until that time ran out, I couldn't, he could not, deal with, with a second pilot. Well, one day I get a call from CBS 
The other pilot didn't sell. That had already been finished. So I called Jim, who was an old friend. And I said, Jim, I said, how would you like to be on this new show I'm doing? He said, fine, he sent me the script. I said, I can't send you the script. He said, why not? I said, because if you read it, you won't take the part. He said, why? I said, because it's, I didn't think you were available, I, and I, it, it's much more minor than you would be in the series. So I don't want you to read this. You won't like it. He said, you mean, you want me to sign a contract to star in a show without reading a script? I said, yeah. He said, you talk me into it. <laughs> and so I did. But we had a relationship. You can do that when you have a relationship. And I was truthful with him. He once said that when he read, he finally got a look at the original script. And he said, my part was shorter than the wine list on an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> he's very funny. He was very funny. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. But I knew that the skipper would be very tough. And everybody I tested was just not right. They turned dark when they started to yell at Bob Denver. Um, and I, and I, I was reluctant to, to go with inferior performance. And one night, Mildred and I, my wife and I, were at a restaurant. And I'm bewailing my fate. And that's what you have wives for, isn't it? <laughs> to be sympathetic when you're in trouble. Anyway, we're in a restaurant on Santa Monica Boulevard. And I had a drink, and I'm saying, I don't know what I'm going to do, because I just, now I have the rest of the cast. I don't have a skipper. And we shoot in two weeks in Hawaii. And as I say this, I look across the restaurant. And sitting in the same restaurant at another table is Alan Hale who had never been interviewed, had never been mentioned. And I took one look and I said, God, there he is. That's the skipper. And she said, go talk to him. Well, he was in a Civil War uniform because this was behind what was then the edge of Fox Studios. He was shooting some movie there. I said, I can't walk over and talk. I don't know him. I have to talk to his agent first. So the next morning, I called his agent, and I said, you represent Alan Hale? And he said, yes. And I said, I'd like him to do a pilot. And he said, send the script over. And I said, well, um, I would like to test him with Bob Denver, because CBS demanded a test in those years. Maybe they still do. Uh, so be, because otherwise, they get re old film, and the guy doesn't look like that anymore, or the woman. Uh, so I said, when can I see him? And they said, well, that's hard to say because he's in uh, Utah. I said, I just saw him last night at dinner. He said, well, that's a cowboy picture they're shooting, and they left early this morning for Utah. I said, well, how can I get a script to him? He said, I'll tell you, he said, they're in a, in, a, in, a, in a gulch somewhere, and you have to go down there on a horse. There's, there's not even, there's no automobile. There's no, t there's no roads. St. George, Utah. I said, well, I need him here for testing with, with Bob Denver, who already has been signed. And they said, well, we don't know how we can arrange this. Because on, on location, you shoot six days a week, which leaves only Sundays available. If, even if he likes the script and he come, wants to come out here, well, what are we going to do about facilities? I said, let me check. Uh, so I talked to Hunt Stromberg. And I said, I found, I believe, the perfect skipper, but he's in St. George, Utah. He said, well, we have to test him. 
I said, well, if you want to test him, we're going to have to keep the facilities open on a Sunday because if he likes the script, his agent, I have now talked to again, he liked the script. I said, and uh, he'll come out here. I'm, I'm ta I'll talk to Bob Denver. I'm sure he'll come in to do this test. And they said, he said, well, that means I have to keep the whole facility open. I said, I think it does. I said, it's important enough to do that. He said, okay. And he did that. He opened the facility. Later on, I learned from Bud, which is what everybody called Alan Hale. Uh, he was down in his St. George Gulch down. And so he had a friend. He learned horses. He had a friend. He and a friend went up to the road a highway, there's a highway near there. And he told his friend to wait with his horse. <laughs> he hitched a ride to Las Vegas, which is right nearby. And he got a plane for LA, told us the time he was coming in. The facilities were open, Bob Denver came in, and we did the test and it was perfect. He was exactly the right person. Well, we made uh, three cast changes after the pilot film. And uh, one of them was Ginger, because Tina Louise was in a play, an unavailable, when we first did the, sh the pilot. And uh, she became available. And these are problems that a producer mm -hmm. has. Later on, I had the same problem with uh, one of the characters in uh, uh, The Brady Bunch. But this is a problem in Gilligan's Island. Uh, Ginger, which Tina Louise, who became available, and she signed in New York to do the show. Now, they told her that Gilligan's Island was a story about a movie star who was stranded on an island with six other people. <laughs> well, I didn't know that. Well, when she arrives in Hollywood, and reads the first three scripts, she comes storming into my office and said, what are these three scripts? I said, why? And she told me what she had been told. I said, well, Tina, every, this is a rotating show. There will be shows featuring you. These first three uh, don't happen to feature you. She said, but I'm supposed to be on a, and she told me her sad plight that she was told it was, uh, they don't care about the producer's headaches. They wanted to sign her because she was perfect for the part. And she was. But, okay. I said, didn't it occur to you when you saw the title was Gilligan's Island? That it wasn't all about Ginger? It wasn't Ginger's Island. She said, I'm just telling you what they told me. I said, okay, I believe you. They were misinforming you, probably, deliberately, but uh, these are the conditions. You will have starring roles, as everybody will. The professor will, and Marianne will, and, and uh, some, the, the Howells will, but that's how it is. Well, she was upset, bang, right away with the show because of that. So it took some time before she realized the, what I was saying was true. <laughs>